Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Milano, one of the most fashionable cities in the world, and cer certainly to the most fashionable surgical meeting in the world. <laughs> Let this session be the catwalk of science and education. This is the first trial update session at the ESCTS. We have a fantastic panel. I uh, thank particularly the trialists who are coming here brave enough to present their results. I'd like to let you know that this session is also streamed live on CTSnet, but also on the ACTS website. And we have a Twitter wall for global interaction. I wish you a good session, and we'll let it start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have an exciting session ahead. Uh, we've got a lot to get through. Um, so can I um, start off by inviting Professor Taggart to share with us the art trial definitive results? Strong words. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So I would first like to thank the association and in particular Domenico Pagano for the opportunity and privilege of making this presentation. And I am going to present the 10 year outcomes of the art trial. I'm going to do this on behalf of all the art investigators and I have no relevant conflicts of interest. So what did we know a decade ago? We knew that cabbage is highly effective for symptoms and or prognosis in multivessel and left main coronary artery disease. There are over 1 million cabbage performed annually worldwide, and in 90% of patients, they get a single ITA graft in two veins. There is strong angiographic evidence of progressive failure of vein grafts that accelerates after five years, and that this increases overall mortality and cardiac morbidity. There is strong angiographic evidence that ITA grafts have excellent long-term patency in excess of 90% at 20 years of follow-up, the left ITA is the standard of care for grafting the left anterior descending coronary artery. There are numerous observational studies that have reported a 20% reduction in mortality with bilateral ITA versus single ITA grafts over the long term. But in Europe and the USA, there's low use of bilateral ITA in contrast to the Far East. And in Europe and USA, this is due to three concerns, the increased technical complexity, the potential for increased mortality and morbidity, and the lack of supportive evidence from randomized trials. So we plan to conduct the ART trial, and our estimate was that at 10 years, beta grafts would result in an absolute 5% reduction in mortality in comparison to CETA grafts. To confirm this with 90% power and a 5% level of significance would require over 2,900 patients. So we aim to enroll over 3,000 patients over a three year period. The primary outcome was 10 year mortality and secondary composite endpoint of all cause mortality, MI or stroke. Inclusion criteria were patients requiring cabbage for multivessel and or left main coronary artery disease. It could include patients with an acute coronary syndrome but not evolving myocardial infarction and operations could be done either on or off pump. We excluded patients who required a single graft, evolving MI, patients requiring concomitant valve surgery or requiring redo cabbage. Patients were enrolled over a three-year period from June 2004 to December 2007. This was done in 28 centres in seven countries, and we randomised 3,100 patients. And I would emphasise from the start that at 10 years, there was exceptionally high use of guideline-directed medical therapy in these patients. Aspirin in over 80%, statins in almost 90%, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and ARB blockers in over 70%. And this is very important because we recently published in JAK this analysis showing that in all the trials of PCI versus cabbage, cabbage patients, although they did better than PCI patients, did so despite receiving substantially inferior medical therapy. If you look at the baseline characteristics in the ART trial, as you might expect in a randomized trial, for almost 20 preoperative characteristics, they were near identical. If you look at what happened in terms of surgery in the ART trial, notice that 40% of patients were done off pump and that the conversion rate from off pump to on pump was 2%. 
adding a second ITA graft added 23 minutes to what was essentially a four-hour procedure, and over 80% of patients had three or four grafts. At 10 years, we had 98.4% vital status, which is remarkable follow-up data over a 10-year period. We carried out two analyses, intention to treat, which is scientifically the most robust because it preserves randomization. We also conducted an treated analysis, which was not randomized, and we did this because 40% of patients actually received a different treatment strategy from that that had initially been proposed 14% of beta cross to CETA, 4% of CETA to beta, and 22% of CETA had a second arterial graft in the form of the radial artery. And that was done at a time when we didn't know that the radial artery led to superior clinical outcomes. If you look at the intention to treat analysis, at 10 years, there was no difference in survival between bilateral and single ITA grafts. In fact, the grafts are all, the curves are almost superimposed. And similarly, for the composite of death, MI, and stroke at 10 years on the intention to treat analysis, no significant difference, although you wonder if there's a trend beginning to emerge at eight years of some separation between these groups. If you look at the as treated analysis, again, I would say emphasize this was not randomized, but if you look at the 20 baseline characteristics between patients with a single ITA graft and those with a multiple who had multiple arterial grafts, you can see highlighted in green that most baseline characteristics are near identical. And even those which were statistically significantly different were very small clinical differences. So for example, age, there was a difference in one year in age. If you look at Euroscore, although it was statistically significantly different, the difference in reality was between 2.7 and 2.5. So these patients, although not randomized, had very similar baseline characteristics. And what did we see in this treated group? In mortality at 10 years, there was a strong survival advantage in favor of the patients who had actually more than one arterial graft. And if we look at the survival curves, they're actively diverging at 10 years. If you look at the composite of death, MI, and stroke at 10 years, again, we see a strong advantage in favor of patients who actually received multiple arterial grafts. So why did we see no difference in the intention to treat analysis between beta and CETA? It may be that there's genuinely no difference, but if that's the case, then it means having more patent arteries in your heart at 10 years does not improve your survival, but that would be inconsistent with the concept that complete revascularization is better than incomplete. As I pointed out, there was an extraordinary high use of guideline-based medical therapy, 22% of the single ITA group also had a radial artery, and I'm going to show you the importance of surgeon experience, because overall, crossover rate from beta to CETA was 14%, but per individual surgeon, it varied from zero to 100%. Now, this paper in the New England Journal recently by the radial investigators demonstrated the importance of a radial artery versus saphenous vein in over 1,000 randomized patients at five years. And you can see a reduction in the COMSA endpoint of death MI and repeat revascularization. And that is due to the difference in graft occlusion at five years, 8% for the radial artery, 20% for vein grafts. If you look in the ART trial on an intention to treat analysis regarding surgeon experience, we can see that surgeons who had done more than 50 operations had a significant reduction in 10-year mortality and in the composite endpoint of death, MI, and stroke. In contrast, surgeons who had done fewer than 50 cases had a reverse finding. They had an a trend towards increased mortality and composite endpoints. And we published this paper in JTCBS actually showing the individual effects of the incidence and clinical implications of intraoperative bilateral ITA graft conversion. As I've said, the overall rate of conversion was 14% from beta to CETA, but only 4% in the reverse direction. But if you look per individual surgeon, the crossover rates varied from zero to 100%. And what we did show was in those patients who crossed at five years, they had substantially inferior clinical outcomes at five years. If you look in this study at the highest individual volume surgeon in the ART trial who personally performed 416 cases, 
with a 1.2% crossover rate. If you look at that surgeon's results on an intention to treat basis, you can see a strong survival benefit in favor of bilateral ITA grafts. And note the benefit doesn't appear until after five years, but by 10 years is increasing rapidly with increasing divergence of survival curves. So to summarize and conclude, ART is the largest cabbage trial with long-term follow-up, over 98% of patients at 10 years. There were excellent 10-year outcomes in both groups. 40% of patients actually received a different treatment from that originally proposed. Then on the intention to treat analysis, this confirmed at 10 years the safety of bilateral ITA grafts and no significant difference in all-cause mortality or composite of mortality MI or stroke. In the as treated, non-randomized analysis at 10 years, as I've emphasized, these patients had very similar baseline characteristics, and there there appeared to be a significant improvement in all-cause mortality in the composite of mortality at MI and stroke. I've shown that surgeon experience is absolutely crucial to crossover rates and eventual clinical outcomes in surgeons who are using bilateral ITA grafts. And we need further randomized trials of single versus multiple arterial grafts, but carried out by appropriately experienced surgeons. And indeed, there's such a trial underway being led by Steve Freems and Mario Gaudino, the Roma trial. And finally, I'm going to conclude by thanking all the patients who took part in this trial and all the surgeons who participated in recruiting patients. And I would like to actually dedicate this presentation to the memorial of Professor Doug Altman, who was a senior statistician in the trial for almost 20 years, who regrettably died in June 2018. On that point, I'm going to conclude my talk. I would like to thank the organizers again for the great privilege of making this presentation, and particularly Domenico Pagano for having really facilitated this. And finally, I would like to thank you, the audience, for your attention. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. We'll, right. Yeah, we'll have uh, questions at the end of each of the three talks, or all three talks. So uh, Nick Fremantle is going to give the surgeons, sorry, the statistician's uh, view of the ART trial. Yeah, if I gave the surgeon's view, that yeah, would be... Uh, that would be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, seem to be locked. <clears throat> so did this happen to you? Yeah, um, I should say this is my office. Um, ah, yeah. Okay, so uh, it's my got job to, to say a few words about the um, strengths and limitations of, of the art trial from a statistical perspective um, and raise issues from the statistical perspective that may be relevant for uh, clinical interpretation. Um, I've got to say it's a great privilege um, to do this. Um, it's very nice to talk about a trial that has been well designed, well conducted and well implemented. Um, I will say first that when we talked about the interim results and what was likely to occur um, at the 10-year results, I do recall that we, um, we did call the results. Um, we predicted the results probabilistically based on the interim uh, results at that time. More seriously, I would echo um, uh, David's comment about um, the, the sadness that pervades today as uh, I also miss Doug Altman's wise counsel um, a, a statistician colleague of enormous um, esteem who has done an awful lot, in, who achieved an awful lot in his career um, to share an understanding uh, of statistics and I had the privilege to work with him for a period of well, more than 20 years. So, what can we say of the ARC trial? Well, a well-designed and implemented trial we need more trials like ART in cardiac surgery. The 10-year follow-up is in incredibly appropriate. Taking an interim look, and um, so sharing some early results at the point that the trial cannot be affected by, uh, the outcome of the trial cannot be affected by sharing those results is an innovation. It is very useful. Um, it is something that, that we need to do with these kind of very long-term trials, otherwise patients will wait a very long time um, to benefit from them. It has an objective primary outcome measure. The primary analysis is by intention to treat and so unbiased. There's a central concealed randomization process and 
in spite of 10 years of follow-up, as on the back of my envelope, there seemed to be less than a 5% loss to follow-up, which is phenomenal. I felt that actually crossover was quite modest with Beamer to Seamer of 14% and Seamer to Beamer of 4% without getting into the, the greater detail. Um, these trials are trials of strategy. I've been involved in a number myself. Things change between randomization and the delivery of a treatment. So it's, it's not straightforward. So I, I would say that this must be towards the upper end of what is achievable in this kind of a trial in, um, in managing to deliver the, the randomized treatment to the patients in those groups. And intention to treat is unbiased. When we look at the as treated or so-called per protocol analyses, we lose the protection from bias um, that we gain from randomization. And ICHE 9, the statistical guidance for, um, for clinical trials um, as part of GCP, describes us that, that um, per protocol analysis achieves a bias which may be severe arising from the fact that adherence to the study protocol may be related to treatment and outcome. So in my professional career, I conduct a lot of, um, a, a lot of observational studies and one of the things that I can often see in those observational studies is the, um, is the effect of clinical judgment on outcome. And what we see in per protocol analyses is, is expert clinicians using their clinical judgment um, in the, for the benefit uh, of the patient. So, what do we say? Well, overall, it's a neutral study. So the subgroups that we see have to be exploratory. Well, I'm going to hazard a guess that the high volume surgeon with Beamer might be Professor Taggart himself, but you know, that's, that's just my guess. Um, I would like to see a, 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 an interaction between volumes and, um, a, 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 and surgery, but I think we, we could be interested in volumes of both kinds of surgery. Because I think if somebody is principally using one modality of surgery in their work, then it may well be that that's what they do best. All of the volume outcome relationships say that. So what about people that principally use a different form of surgery in their work? Um, what do their outcomes look like? So really well conducted. I'd say a superb trial, neutral on the primary outcome. I would say it gives us a very definite answer. There is an increased complication rate with BEMA. The trial gives no basis, from a statistical point of view at least, um, for a switch to BEMA as a mode of um, treatment delivery. But equally, I would say, um, complication rate aside, no particular reason to argue to, for those that are currently doing it successfully um, to stop doing it. And I think in the interest of time, I will stop there. But thank you very much for your attention. Stephen Freems, I'm going to um, discuss the implications for clinical practice. I thank the organizers for inviting me, particularly uh, Dr. Pagano. Um, I also thank uh, David Taggart for sharing his slides with me ahead of time. So what are the implications for clinical practice? These are my disclosures uh, of relevance. Um, we do have research grants for ROMA. So Dr. Pagano actually provided me with three, these three questions to uh, uh, organize my talk. So this is a slide David uh, Taggart presented, the intention treat analysis, 80% uh, survival at 10 years, remember that number. And event-free survival, 75% at 10 years, remember that number. So how do these results affect clinical practice? Well, for many patients, Survival is excellent at 10 years, which means that for many patients, late events will be in the second or third decade after cabbage, not the first decade. And this is whether you use a CETA or a beta. Presumably, optimal medical therapy is very important. Unlike, uh, likely other secondary prevention measures are also important. Um, I should say that the findings in art are probably most applicable to patients with stable ischemic heart disease 
or non-emergent ACS and low risk scores. How do these results affect the revascularization guidelines? So I want to show you that in the as-treated analysis, the survival curves are diverging. They're diverging earlier and they're diverging later. And the event-free survival curves are fairly parallel for most of the time, but late they're diverging. So we expect to see in the second or possibly third decade, there'll be even a greater bent in those who had bilateral internal thoracic arteries. So these are the uh, 2018 uh, EAX procedural guidelines for cabbage. And uh, with relevance to this talk, complete revascularization is a class one and in art, more than 80% of patients had three plus grafts. In other words, they were completely revascularized, and I think that is associated with the uh, excellent long-term survival. That all patients did get an IMA to the LAD, that uh, presumably in the as-treated group, additional arterial grafts were used in the appropriate patients. For the radials, there were uh, quite a number of patients got a radial. Uh, in 2018, uh, radial artery is a class one indication for patients with a high-grade lesion. There was an increased risk of sternal infection in the beta group, and uh, when you skeletonized IMAs, there was a reduction in that risk. And uh, that, again, is consistent with the EX guidelines. So what are the implications for ongoing research? Uh, doctors, Gideon and I are the PIs, and you could say that Roma is art, the sequel. So we did design with many of the um, uh, factors of art in mind. First of all, the uh, sample size, it's event-driven, and art was underpowered in the end. The uh, mortality was uh, expected to be 25% at 10 years, and it was 20. In Roma, the primary outcome is MACE, and art it was all-cause mortality. In Roma, the single arterial group is LIDA plus vein grafts. In ART, more than 20% of uh, radial artery, sorry, more than 20% of CETA patients had a radial artery. In Roma, the second arterial graft is either the ITA or radial, according to surgeon decision, and additional arterial grafts are allowed. In ART, beta was the strategy. And in Roma, we had a private uh, pilot phase to assess protocol adherence. In art, the crossover rate was greater than 50%. As well, in Roma, we have strict surgeon eligibility, as Dagger thought uh, was important. This is the hypotheses, primary and secondary. And enrollment is 4,300 patients, which will likely take uh, three and a half to four years. In to terms of total sample size, Roma is 4,300 which positions it between uh, ART and coronary as the largest revascularization trial. These are the milestones. Uh, in particular, a uh, uh, study design manuscript is in, uh, published last year at EJCTS. One year ago, we presented in a plenary session the Roma uh, study design. In January of uh, this year, we started uh, this, the pilot phase. We did receive internal funding and then uh, by September, we completed the pilot phase. And we did that with a crossover rate of 2.6% and any protocol violation of 4.2%. And as of this month, uh, we've recruited more than 500 patients. So how do these results affect clinical practice? I think that complete revascularization to secondary prevention is crucial. Uh, these uh, revascularization guidelines are very consistent with the 2018 recommendations. And I think the ITT results justify further, result, further trials in arterial grafting. However, I would strongly uh, in, encourage uh, Dr. Taggart to continue follow-up of the ART patients, because I think we will see uh, separation of the curves in the ITT group uh, in the second decade. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have an opportunity for a question or two from the floor, if anyone has one. Nobody jumping up. Yes. Microphone five. Always first is difficult. Thank you very much for sharing us the art trial results. Uh, 
Professor Taggart, uh, the most scared uh, complication of uh, beta grafting is the deep tissue infections. What did you see between the different uh, between uh, the groups? Uh, is there any difference concerning the mediastinitis and uh, concerning uh, mediastinitis patients? Uh, what were the most important risk factors? So the is this on? Can you should be. Yeah. Okay, th thank you. So what we reported, I didn't have time in the 10 minutes today, the incidence of sternal wound, deep sternal wound infection was 0.6% in the single group, 1.9% in the bilateral group, so an absolute difference of 1.3% or a number needed to harm of 7 to 8 patients. However, if you take out the obese patients with diabetes, there's no difference in the risk of deep sternal wound infection if you have skeletonized both ITAs. Is there any difference concerning the mediastinitis patients, uh, the mortality? Uh, I, I can't tell you that offhand. I, I, would, I, I can't remember those numbers. Thank you. It's a question for uh, Professor Target. Um, in terms of the bilateral mammary uh, 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 strategy of grafting, can you comment in the art trial? Was this in situ mammaries? Was it a Y configuration? Can you? Okay, sequentials, so no sequentials. we didn't specify whether it was inside you or composite, but what we did specify was the two ITA grafts had to be used to the two best left-sided vessels. So it, you couldn't use it on the right side. So, so there is no multiple, in general, there is no multiple anastomosis made with the two arteries? Generally not. Okay. And if I could just make a quick comment to um, Dr. Fremantle again, I think that was a very fair um, opinion, statistical opinion, and same with Steve Freem's review. But what, the one mistake we made in this trial that I would do differently if I was going back, but we, we initiated this in 2002, 17 years ago, and the one mistake we made was not ensuring that sergeants had the appropriate experience. We took it on face value that they were meant to have done 50 cases. But when we analyzed the results, it became clear that a lot of the sergeants had not actually done that. And I think that did impact on the results. Yes. Yeah. If you come to an end of a trial of this magnitude with one regret that you would do differently next time, that points to an awful lot of things that you've got right. Um, but it's an, important, well, thank you. It's, it's an important point to take forward um, for the future. I, I've also been involved in studies where, um, where uh, patient, uh, uh, clinician experience has been really important and has impacted on the results. But I suppose the one thing I would say is in the real world, um, people would adopt this kind of a, a, of a technology, a kind of approach, um, without having had that experience and would have to learn. So this is at least giving us a view of the variety of outcomes depending on um, who's actually delivering. And as Steve Freem said, they've taken this very seriously in the Roma trial, where they, they have witnessed a crossover rate of 2%. Ours was seven times that. Yeah, I, I still think you've achieved a, a very impressive um, adherence rate. But, well, thank you. you know, that's, yeah. One more question. Yeah. To Dr. Uh, Taggett, uh, in the art trial, the, almost half of the patients underwent the out pump surgery. Oh, and uh, do you, does, do all the patients have the measurements of the blood flow during the operation? And because the lantern patency rate is inferior uh, for the off pump to arm pump, so do you think the, the advantage of the BIMA was compromised by the um, inferior lantern patency of the uh, graft? Well, it's a very good question, but in the ART trial, very few people did routine intraoperative flow measurements. But what was very striking about ART, whereas there was a high crossover rate from beta to ceta, in the terms of the 40% of patients done off pump, there was only a 2% conversion rate. So it meant the surgeons were far better at doing off pump surgery than they were at using bilateral ITA grafts. And what I can also tell you is if you look at the 10 year outcomes of the 40% of patients done off pump, they are identical to the on pump group. So we did not see inferior clinical outcomes at 10 years in patients who were done off pump. Okay, thank, thank you. you.
I'm Thank you. going to ask um, um, Professor Windeker to make a comment from the point of view of a cardiologist. Yeah. Yes, so uh, David, first <coughs> I want to applaud you for conducting a Thank very you. difficult, uh, uh, strictly uh, methodologically a high standard uh, trial. Thank you. And my question to you is uh, from a cardiology point of uh, perspective, uh, how to implement this in the future into uh, guidelines, because my biased view as a cardiologist is in favor of arterial uh, revascularization. And I think uh, the question I want to ask to you and maybe also the panel is whether you, in terms of the primary endpoint, have been overly ambitious in aiming at all cause um, mortality, given the fact uh, that really we realized during the past two decades uh, that only 50% of mortality is cardiovascular, but that the other 50% is predominant due to progress in the cardiovascular field due to non-cardiovascular uh, uh, mortality. And therefore, I'm wondering whether, in analogy to cardiology, you would not engage into other endpoints uh, like repeat revascularization, uh, myocardial infarction, which from a patient point perspective are still uh, rather relevant. And I didn't see any data you presented to this uh, effect, but uh, maybe you can uh, give us uh, some more insights as it relates to these other uh, secondary endpoint outcomes. So, so very briefly, I would say that we did actually power this trial, but based on an expected mortality of 25% when it was 20%. But I still think that in all trials we can talk about different endpoints, but the one that really counts is mortality. Because even depending on how you define myocardial infarction, you can change what number you want to come up with, but no one is going to argue with mortality as an endpoint. So I still think if we're going to do big surgical operations, we have to show that there is a mortality benefit Thank you very much. It would be lovely to discuss this further, but sadly, we're, as I keep on saying, slaves to the clock. We'll have to move on. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we move on to the, to the impact trial and invite um, uh, Professor Glenner to share um, the trial results with us. Mr. The, dear colleagues, Mr. The moderator, first of all, I'd like to thank the association, specifically the secretary, Dr. Pagano, for the privilege of presenting uh, these uh, results of our impact trial. So uh, the title of this trial is The Impact of Preoperative FFR on Arterial Bypass Graph Functionality. I also have to thank all the um, physicians that have been including patients in this trial, and Dr. Godino for his fantastic analysis of uh, the data. I have nothing to declare. So the hypothesis is that FFR in cabbage could allow the surgeon to plan the surgical strategy. What does that mean? It means that it would allow the surgeon to better choose the graft, but also choose which target is going to be bypassed. And how is this possible? Because FFR could give us much more information over classical angiographic visual estimation. Also, FFR could decrease the risk of high competition flow and graft occlusion in arterial grafting. And this trial is only about arterial grafting. So this is the consult flow chart of the trial. As soon as the patient has had non-invasive tests showing, showing some ischemia, he benefits of a diagnostic angiogram. And when the interventional or non-interventional cardiologists found a significant three-vessel disease that is suitable for surgery, the patient then becomes included in the trial and have a FFR measurement in all diseased vessels. These FFR results are blind from the cardiologist and from the surgeon. This is, of course, crucial. Then the patient is seen by a surgeon and consented for a second repeat angiogram six months post bypass surgery, and the surgery is only complete arterial revascularization. So most of these patients were younger age patients. Once again, the results of the uh, FFR are blinded from the cardiologist and from the surgeon. 
The primary endpoint is to evaluate the impact of the preoperative FFR on arterial bypass anastomosis function at six months with systematic angiographic follow-up. Secondary endpoint was to correlate this FFR measurement with graph configuration in situ versus composite, but also to evaluate the anastomosis functionality with the FFR and the MACE rate at mean follow-up. We used a different grading of the functionality of the anastomosis compared to the classical patency. Why? Because we only use arterial grafting and the patency, the classical Fitzgibbon patency, has been defined mainly for veins. So zero was an occluded anastomosis, one a native coronary artery uh, with a dominant flow, two a balanced flow, and three a fully opacified uh, coronary artery by the graft. So we decided to say that a uh, anastomosis was not functional when you had a score from zero to two and functional only when the anastomosis was opacified by the graft only, which is completely different than the conventional patency where you would consider a patent anastomosis with a grade one to three and only a non-patent anastomosis when the anastomosis is occluded. We were today able to enroll 80 patients with uh, 63 of them who benefited with a six-month systematic angiogram. And in fact, these results are the midterm uh, analysis requested by the DSMB. We were able to um, uh, control uh, 199 anastomosis and 68% were sequential anastomosis and 86 were uh, y bilateral memory Y grafting configuration. This is the uh, patient characteristics. Mean age is 67. Uh, as you can see, um, the mean SIGDAC score is 22. We also looked at the target vessel size. We looked at the runoff, grading the runoff from good, uh, medium, and poor. And 78% uh, of the procedure were off-pump procedures. This is what we observed. We observed that looking at the uh, Lita anastomosis, 8.3% were occluded. Looking at the right memory anastomosis, 17% were occluded. And looking at the radial anastomosis, 20%, in fact, two anastomoses were occluded. Now, when we looked at the functional versus non-functional, 85% of the anastomosis with the left memory were functional. 69 in the right memory and 70 in the radial artery. This is not graft patency, this is anastomosis functionality, which is significantly different. For me, one of the most important findings of this trial is that there is a very, very, very poor correlation between the pre-op FFR significance, defined as 0.8, and the angiographic stenosis, as you can see, at the upper part of this figure, there is a lot of patients that received a bypass while the FFR was above 0.8. When we looked at the correlation between FFR and angiographic stenosis uh, estimated by visual inspection, we found that the uh, lower FFR were found in the LAD territory with a 0.71 FFR, and this is not surprising because the LAD has the largest runoff and the largest myocardial that could explain the lower FFR. Now, when we looked at the association between the percentage of stenosis by visual inspection and the graph function in univariate, nothing was significant, showing that eyeballing is definitely not a good way to predict if anastomosis is going to function or not. On the contrary, when we looked at the preoperative FFR and the graph function at six months, we found a significant correlation with a p-value of 0 0.001 in every subcategory of the functionality, showing a very significant and strong correlation between the FFR and the graph functionality at six months in univariate. When we looked at the multivariate analysis, we found exactly the same results, whether um, there was no importance on the territory, the way how we're using the graft, the type of graft, and the graft configuration. Everything is 
highly, highly significant between the pre-op FFR and the graph function in multivariable analysis. So when we looked at the functional versus non-functional, and this is the um, most important finding, we found a clear cutoff of 0.78 of FFR above which arterial anastomosis are significantly less functional versus below 0.78, and this is the first time we found as such a, a cutoff. When we looked at this cutoff, and this is very important, um, pre-op FFR below 0.78, 98% of the anastomosis were perfectly functional, which is not uh, at all the case above 0.78. So to talk about classical patency, the classical patency below 0.78 would be 98%, very high patency. When we looked at the area under the curve with a um, predictive about 0.7, we see that uh, the occluded anastomosis and FFR is highly significant, while visual inspection, it's not significant. We found exactly the same area under the curve with the functionality, significant with FFR, not significant with visual inspection. We also looked at per graft and per territory, and we found exactly the same significance um, with a uh, higher area of, uh, uh, under the curve of 0.7 in each of the uh, graft and each of the territories. So once again, FFR allows us to know which anastomosis is going to function at six months. When we looked at graft uh, anastomosis occlusion, we know that when we have an FFR below 0.78, the um, patency rate is 98%. So we looked what happened above 78. And in fact, there is a significant benefit of doing sequential anastomosis when the FFR is above 0.78. There is a significant difference in the patient that have had sequential grafting versus those who did not have sequential grafting with more occluded graft in non-sequential grafting. When we looked in the uh, non-sequential grafting per territory, we also found a significant difference showing that when you do a single bypass on the PDA versus the circumflex, you have more occluded graft on the PDA compared to the circumflex, and this could be explained to the fact that the longer the arterial anastomosis, the higher the drop of pressure, the higher competition flow you have. So we analyzed if there were a clear um, difference in the FFR and the cutoff between circumflex and right coronary artery territory, and we did find a different cutoff while targeting the PDA and the PLA. So the global cutoff is 0.78, but once you want to target the PDA or the PLA with an artery, the cutoff goes down to 0.71. In conclusion, I can say that we found a very, very poor correlation between angiographic stenosis, so eyeballing, visual estimation of the stenosis and FFR. There is no correlation between the angiostenosis and the graft anastomosis function at six months, while there is a highly significant correlation between FFR and anastomosis function. We found an overall global FFR cutoff of 0.78 to have a functional arterial anastomosis six months post bypass surgery. And when you target the right coronary artery, this cutoff goes down to 0.71. I think that this cutoff will, uh, is a game changer for arterial grafting, specifically uh, in uh, moderate stenosis. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I think we might start by asking um, uh, Professor Windico if he might like to make any comments in response. Yes, so thank you. I think these are very provocative uh, data and uh, obviously as a cardiologist I'm very pleased to see that uh, physiology beyond uh, coronary anatomy will play a role also in uh, surgery in the graft and target vessel um, selection. 
Uh, one question I would have to you is whether you could share with us uh, the potential to decrease the number of grafts based on the FFR values. So you indicated that the FNR, FFR cutoff of less than 0 0.78 is indicative of what you call imperfect result. So in other words, uh, could you provide us with uh, some data how many how fewer grafts you would need to use if you adhere that cutoff of 0 0.78? So that's enough, a very good question. It's, it's often a, a question I have when I start to talk about um, the functional um, syntax core. Uh, and we will have these results with um, two uh, prospective randomized trials with CABBAGE and FFR, the Graffiti trial and the Fargo trial that have looked at the FFR guided versus the eyeballing guided. Uh, because I am not convinced that, like in a PCI world, bypassing a, a non-significant lesion has a long-term maze impact on the patient. This is something that has not yet been described, and that's why these two prospective randomized trials that are ongoing will definitely uh, give us an answer uh, to your question. Thank you. We have a question from the floor. Uh, Jasinski Roklow, Poland. David, excellent study. Uh, well, you, you, uh, you compared or you just, you were searching for correlation and you described that. Correlation between FFR and the patency in different territories. However, have you looked at the different grafts? For example, comparing radial and uh, bilateral mammary, especially with sequential grafting. Ahead of time. So, unfortunately, the number of um, radial in our theory is not uh, sufficient to draw a, a clear difference between the right memory and the radial artery. What I can tell you is that when we looked at the difference between right memory, sequential anastomosis, or not sequential anastomosis, and the left memory, so the lateral wall versus the anterior wall, okay. there were no difference with the FFR cutoff or the, the functionality of the graft. Thank you. And the problem is that the radial was mainly used to target the right, so that's why the FFR was lower. Okay, let's I go back to... Next is microphone 10. Can we have microphone 10, Want to try uh, nine in that case? <laughs> Number 10. Okay. Um, okay. Thorsten Dürens, Jena, Germany. A very nice presentation. Uh, what happens to the patients uh, that had graft occlusions, did they derive any clinical events from it? So there were eight um, re-intervention at one year follow-up, so eight PCIs, and we looked at the uh, pre-op FFR and there was a significant difference. So 49 uh, anastomoses were not functional and when we looked at those that had a PCI, there was a significant lower FFR in those compared to those that had no uh, PCI. I mean, clinical events, did they have myocardial well, infarctions, did they die? There were no uh, myocardial infarction, no death. These were only uh, findings during the control angiogram. Thanks. David, um, I congratulate you on a usual fantastic scientific study, but I would have one caution and it's your classification. And I don't think that you should classify something with poor functionality in the same category as occluded. If something is occluded at six months, it's occluded five years later. If something, especially a, a, an arterial graft, if it has low flow at six months, as native disease progresses, that graft can open up completely. So I think the implication for an arterial graft is different for a venous graft. And if you gave me the choice of having an occluded arterial graft or one that is patent with low flow, I'll go for the one that's patent with low flow. I, I agree you. with you, and that's why in the analysis we looked at the occluded versus the non-functional, which is some kind of looking at the classical patency versus the functional, uh, the functionality of the graft. And in fact, the reason why we, we had the idea of this trial is when I looked at the angiogram of my two prospective randomized trial comparing different types of graft configuration with systematic angiogram at six months and three years, I found that in intermediate lesions, 
I had um, some very weird angiographic foundings at six months and three years where yeah. when you were injecting the, the native coronary artery, you were fully opacified the graft, but once you were injecting the graft, you were barely seeing sure. the native coronary artery. So what does that mean at long term? We don't know. And it's something that you don't find with veins. So that's why we thought that FFR could allow us to decrease that phenomenon. Thank you. Have time. Uh, so one quick question. Last um, question, yeah. yeah. David, brilliant work. This, I just want to mention, this is entirely in keeping with the work of Philip Hayward, a paper he wrote a few years ago on the right coronary artery lesions. The moderate stenosis, 50 to 69 percent. He, he, they found that at three years, if you bypass that right coronary artery, the disease progressed in the native right coronary artery. And then the vein, if it was a vein graft, it was going to go down. If you did not touch that right coronary artery, the, vein, the disease did not progress. However, in the left-sided system with uh, a moderate lesion, they did progress. So since that paper came out, I rarely bypass a moderate lesion right coronary artery, which is entirely in keeping with your FFR 0.71. Thank you. So I completely agree with you. But once again, I think in, in the surgical community, um, I think that it's, we have to move to the classical eyeballing to something better, specifically in the intermediate lesions. I often hear, for example, that, oh, it's a 60% lesion, but a three vessel disease, so I'm gonna put a vein on that 60% lesion. I'm not sure it's the ideal um, strategy. And once again, I think that these two prospective randomized trials, the graffiti trial and the Fargo trial, will give us the definitive answer to your, to your question, to your comment. Thanks Thank very you. much. Well, we'll move on in this packed session. We're now going to move on and um, discuss the MITRE uh, FR trial and the COAT trial. So I invite uh, Professor Abadia to come and um, present on that topic. Thank you. Okay, first, uh, I will thank the, the ACT for this invitation to comment the French prospective one of my study I conducted and also to, to comment the co-op study which has been run in the US. These are my conflicts. And, uh, well, you already know the result of those two studies, so I will not uh, describe those two studies one by one. I will just try to put in parallel the results and to try to understand why the results are so different. First of all, as you see, in France, we published the protocol three years before the publication of the result of mitri -FAR. On the opposite, uh, the, the protocol of COAPT has been published two months before the publication of the result, but as you see, they are really, really very different. Concerning the uh, eligibility criteria, there are really strong difference. In France, probably our patients were more severe. They had at least one hospitalization during the 12 months preceding randomization, while on the opposite, in the US, only 50% of those patients had an hospitalization because the other 50% of the patient, 52 exactly, uh, had just a BNP level uh, above 300 or antipo BNP above. 1,500, and this makes a difference. Also, in Europe, we consider the definition of uh, regurgitation as it is in the guidelines, that is to say a surface above 20 millimeters square, while on the other side of the Atlantic, in the US, they respected the US guideline, and uh, the definition was more severe. Uh, it was an integrative approach, but it means, uh, as you will see, a surface above 30 or 40 millimeters square, which makes a strong difference between the selection process of those two studies. Also, again, in favor of more severe patients in mitri -FAR, you see that our ejection fraction has the possibility to go very, very low, down to 15%, while on the opposite, the ejection fraction 
and uh, co-opt was limited to 20 and went up until 50 percent. So you see clearly a selection of patients which is uh, very different. Both studies, of course, are the centralized core lab, which is uh, absolutely essential if uh, we want to respect the quality of two prospective randomized study. So another difference, um, our study in France was uh, uh, supported by a French research program grant from the Ministry of Health. And we also had, and it was very important to mention, the partial support of uh, ABOT, and it was really important to have uh, the high quality of their proctoring during the procedure. On the opposite, there was uh, more centers, 89 centers in the US, and uh, I would like to point out uh, this point. You see that the most important center in the US included 46 patients in a period of close to five years. That is to say that the biggest center recruiting patients in COAPT included less than eight patients per year. So the selection process was very, very, very high in COAPT. And you see the selection here in France, out of uh, 452 patients, we had 152 patients in the intention to treat. Interestingly, our follow-up was very accurate, up to 90%, and also we had a pair protocol analysis in the second step. On the opposite, you see that the selection process in COAPT, they started from uh, 1,500 patients, and finally they recruited more patients than uh, in COAPT, exactly the double, 300 in each arm. Concerning the safety, the st two studies uh, confirm the, the safety of the mitral clip procedure. We had no conversion to surgery no mortality during the four days following surgery, and very few vascular complications, stroke, or tamponade. And on, those, on this point, uh, COAPT confirms, uh, but we already knew that from different registries. Uh, Mitra clip implantation is a really, really safe technique. Now we have two prospective randomized studies published in the New England and confirm the safety of those techniques. Concerning the procedural success, meaning uh, MR less than grad 2 or less, you see that we have improved from the first presentation, the Everest 2 trial published seven years ago, where the procedural success was 77. But today, MitraFR, COAPT, and other registries, we are clearly largely above 90%. So today, the capacity with a clip to correct the mitral regurgitation in heart failure patients with secondary MR is really, really efficient. And this is what we have in mitral FR. You see the patient has discharged, a significant difference, and also something that the surgeon have known for many years, that when we follow the patient after a surgical mitral valve repair, it has been published many times, we know that there is some kind of deterioration of the result over time, and you see that after uh, one year, there is uh, only 83%, but it's, uh, it's really different for the medical treatment, and also we know that when you follow the patient, as soon as the patient are inside a prospective randomized study, the follow-up is more accurate, and the patient improves, and you see also the regurgitation is uh, uh, improved in the, the medical treatment group. This is the difference in, in, uh, between the two, uh, in, uh, in mitra FR, between the two protocols. If we compare with the COAPT, COAPT, you see, they have slightly more, uh, they have the, the, the same result as discharge. But after one year, and this is probably one of the most surprising results is COAPT, they have not seen a deterioration of their result in terms of uh, control of the regurgitation. And also in the COAPT trial, the medical treatment group also improved its uh, regurgitation uh, rate. Again, this is uh, the most, for me as a surgeon, the most surprising a result of COAPT, you see that the quality of the control with the clip not only is stable, but apparently it improves. But we have to pay attention to that because there is a, a bias 
since at two years, 50% 50 50 of the patients are dead. So the evaluation here concerns only the patient who survives. So probably the worst result are already dead. But anyhow, it is at least stable. And this is very, very impressive that just a clip does much better than what we have done as surgeon for 30 years. Uh, if we look now to any uh, subgroup analysis in uh, Mitra FRA, we have absolutely no difference. For this part of the analysis in uh, Mitra FRA, we are probably underpowered because uh, we have less uh, patients in those, uh, each uh, subgroup. On the opposite, you see, uh, when we put the two studies in parallel, you have always yes on one side and no on the other side. And it is all, whatever you, you look at, it's always this, uh, completely opposite. And you see that in COAPT, almost every subgroup analysis is in favor of the patient who receive CLIP versus those who had the medical treatment alone. This is a primary composite endpoint in MITRIFAR. It was not the same in the two studies. Here it's all cause death unplanned rehospitalization for heart failure uh, and uh, the no difference, as you see. Again, 99% of follow-up. So the result of MITRIFR are really strong, on, I mean, on a statistically standpoint. And the answer we gave is really no in this uh, subgroup of patients according to our uh, eligibility criteria. And if we split the um, composite endpoint, we look at just death, just rehospitalization. If you do also a pair protocol analysis, as this to say, a comparison of the patient who really receives the clip in accordance to the protocol versus those who didn't, no more difference, no more difference in mortality, no more difference in terms of rehospitalization rate. Of course, corrupt, you know that the difference is really important. We may argue that if you look here at the very beginning, you see that there is a difference after a few weeks, few weeks. Maybe there is a bias of interpretation of the people who had to follow the patient. Again, if you split uh, um, the composite endpoint, it's uh, the same for uh, co-op. Everything is positive. So in summary, uh, our inclusion criteria were really different. And you see also that uh, in, uh, in, co in um, COAPT, they refuse patients with very dilated ventricle. And as a consequence, the two populations selected by the two studies are really different. You see the surface of regurgitation, which is much smaller in mitral far rather than COAPT. The ventricle in mitral far was highly dilated, which, which is, was not the case uh, in, uh, in COAPT. And in COAPT, they have tried to, to do a subgroup analysis, decreasing the size of the ventricle and increasing the uh, volume of uh, the regurgitation. And here on the top left, you see what we, co we could call the mitral far like patients of COAPT and you see that there is no difference. So there is a consistency when we, we, we look at those studies and you can uh, finally understand why those two studies are only apparently uh, in opposition. In conclusion, MITRIFR can tell us when we should not treat the patient when the ventricle is too de much deteriorated and probably uh, no clip or no surgery have to be done here. On the other hand, when we have a very accurate selection of uh, this secondary MR patient, we can improve dramatically either mortality and rehospitalization rate. And uh, there is also, of course, we have confirmed the safety and the efficacy on both studies. This has to be kept in mind. And there is another additional um, uh, surgical consequence. So today, and it is hard, maybe hard for the surgeon, but there will have, we will have no more indication for the surgery in the future because either the patient corresponds to midwife far selection and there is no indication, or they correspond to co-opt indication and we will have to put a clip. Anyhow, thank you for your attention. I think it's important for the surgeon to lead prospective randomized study because the more I read to those papers, the more I am convinced that uh, 
the answer highly depends on the way you ask the question. So we have to promote more and more perspective around my study if we want to keep our influence in the future. Thank you for your attention. So uh, Nick Fremantle will now present the statistician's view seat. and we'll take questions at the end. Thank you very much for an excellent talk. That was great. Yeah, it's very good. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to make a few comments about MitraFR and co-op. I suppose the first comment I would make is that I've been involved in my career um, in literally um, hundreds of trials, and, and I've yet to be involved in one where everything is positive. But, you know, there'll be a first time. I've got no conflicts of interest for this presentation. I'm going to run through each of the trials from a statistical point of view, from a trialist point of view, to, to comment on um, concerns or strengths that I might have. Um, randomization for co-op, stratified by center, but in an open trial. Um, it is well known that clinicians, investigators, um, tot up the numbers of patients that they have in their center by group in open trials. Um, I've found this in my own experience. I wouldn't use a stratification by center in an open trial because it does um, raise the potential for selection bias. In COAPT, we do see more severe patients in the uh, control condition um, at baseline. So if we simply look at the New York Heart Association classes using a proportional odds model to compare those two sets of classes, we see a significant um, increase in um, risk, in severity, in the uh, control condition uh, with an odds ratio of 1.44. So providing some evidence that in fact um, we are seeing some kind of, we could be seeing some kind of selection. Um, we also see at baseline um, differences in the use of beta blockers with more um, uh, beta blockers, ASI, ARB and ARNI used at baseline. Also at 30 days in one year, but things after randomization um, we need to be wary of because those could, could be as a result um, of the randomization. And surprisingly, the design of the co-op study talked about 5% uh, one-sided alpha. Um, we don't really need to go into that, but it, it's a sign of enormous caution in terms of um, seeking a positive result um, from the uh, investigators. And it certainly isn't um, statistical orthodoxy or regulatory orthodoxy. Um, COAPT used um, heart failure hospitalizations, uh, all heart failure hospitalizations. I would say, haven't we learned from the Capricorn study way back, um, which used all-cause hospitalizations in a in a rather more severe uh, population, albeit, but we learned from that that um, patients get hospitalized. Um, the uh, response to that uh, learning has been to include um, unplanned heart failure hospitalizations in um, regulatory studies in this area. Um, there's a risk that uh, concern leads to planned hospitalization, particularly um, when there may be differences in contact uh, between the two randomized um, conditions. Mitra FR, on the other hand, well, had the randomization stratified by center, um, it's quite common, so that, that uh, potential bias is there. Um, very low loss to follow up, only three patients not included in the ITT analysis, which is excellent. Use the regulatory standard endpoint um, of the composite of all-cause mortality plus unplanned hospitalization, which is very familiar in these heart failure um, type um, studies. So what's staggering is the difference in the results that we see. Um, we've already um, uh, seen that nicely described. The odds ratio for the mitra FR um, primary outcome is 1.16. The hazard ratio um, for COAPT um, is 0.53. Um, wildly different, four standard errors apart, um, looking that these are not apparently measuring um, the same thing. In COAPT, the mortality reduction at two years is nominally significant. I say nominally because there have been many tests conducted on these data before we get that far, 
but it's a very interesting and potentially um, well intriguing finding with a hazard ratio of 0.62, um, uh, which is strongly st uh, statistically significant. The place that we have in common between um, mitre FR and CARAPT is, of course, at the 12-month or cause mortality point. So I conducted a quick um, meta-analysis of that to show um, a pretty convincing um, no difference at that um, point. Um, I will just say something about something that, that upset me about the CARAPT paper. Um, Fisher made a comment that, as statisticians, we need to describe and communicate what we do very clearly. I took issue with this outcome, safety, freedom from device-related uh, complications at 12 months, uh, Kaplan-Meier estimate of event-free um, with a confidence interval uh, and a very tiny p-value. That actually translates, at least on the back of my envelope, to a 3.4% um, highly significant uh, rate of important device complications, and those are the complications uh, listed at the bottom of the slide, none of, them, none of them that we would want to experience. So, comments. Well, quite unclear why the results on the primary outcome are so different. The two trials not estimating the same thing. Uh, we do see some differences in background therapy increasing during the trial. We see some differences in um, co-opt in, um, in, in the severity between the groups. Mortality at one year similarly, with, uh, similar with no evidence of benefit for mitroclip. Second year mortality results showing nominally significant big difference for mitroclip and co-op, but not so far measured in mitro-FR, and I'm very interested to hear if that follow-up is planned. Um, just on the basis of what we have here, I cannot believe that if mitroclip was a pharmaceutical, that it would get a marketing authorization on the basis of these two trials. So I'll stop there. Thank you. So, I guess the first question is to you. Um, you gave us uh, an excellent overview. Um, has your clinical practice changed uh, as a French cardiologist since COAPT? It should be on. Yes, does it work? No. No. Step Try the podium. Step. Yeah, podium then. Well, you know, in France, the, uh, we have no reimbursement for secondary MR. So the only way we had to uh, treat those patients or either to enroll the patient in the study or to have a, a specific budget on our own hospital. So there is a huge limitation in France. So we cannot uh, change for this reason. So I, I cannot say that the, the results of the study has changed anything in our practice. Well, anyhow, if I may add a comment, we will soon have the two-year follow-up for MITRI-FAR, and that will be interesting, because as, as you mentioned, at one year there is no difference in co-op, and after we see the two curves, which are the trend to, to separate, and maybe we could have a surprise. We, we need to do, to do that. It would be a good surprise. Uh, well, yes, it would well, be good so, for humanity. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it would be a really, really big surprise at the hour. <laughs> If, if I can just make a comment from a cardiology perspective, I think there are three, three things that I find in the co-op that is a little bit puzzling. Um, the first, I think, is the difference in medical therapy that uh, Nick uh, pointed out, yeah. which persisted at uh, one year and two years. Um, yes, it's, it's either on beta blocker and, uh, and, right. uh, and so it's, it's, it may have influenced the result, but it was m margin. Yeah, but the, because the event rates, because the patient numbers are small, so even if there is a difference of two or three deaths, it may have skewed the results quite significantly. Yeah. So that was, that was the first concern that I have from, from um, COAPT. The, the second is the uh, plausibility of the benefit. Um, most of the heart failure therapy that we have, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, CRT, they all improve either reverse remodeling or the functional capacity in six minute walk, which we didn't see in co-apt. There, was, yeah, 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 see, in there co was no significant difference in the LV significant. size or six minute walk distance. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the only other heart failure therapy that has got benefit without affecting reverse remodeling or six minute walk distance mm -hmm. actually is an ICD. Mm -hmm. um, so that is uh, it's a bit curious and it's also at odds with the 
analysis of the Everest study, where they looked at the reverse remodeling, which correlated very well with uh, reduction in, in mitral regurgitation. Mm -hmm. So this is also a little bit strange, um, how, what the mechanism of the benefit, you know, quite substantial benefit. And I guess lastly, the, uh, the mortality in these patients are extremely high. Uh, two, years, two year mortality of 40 plus percent is very substantial. Um, and that's in the category of the Intermax four or five kind of patients. These are an, comparable to NYHA class three, class four patients, not NYHA class two. So these are, this is well in the region of LVAT therapy and, and transplantation. That's, that's the kind of magnitude of mortality that we're seeing in these patients. So, uh, and and it's, that is quite surprising because that's, not, that's higher than some of the observational studies that have been described with functional MRB in the past. Absolutely. Okay, I fully agree, of course. Stefan? Maybe just to come on from a cardiology point of view. First, the medical treatment. Uh, I think what you need to realize is that obviously you can improve and maximize medical treatment if you have a successful CLIP procedure. And I think in all fairness, uh, Jean-Francois, you should admit uh, that there is no data uh, regarding medical treatment in mitral FR. Mm -hmm. So we have doing follow-up data in COAPT, but they are missing in uh, mitral FR. Regarding the mechanism, I think the preliminary data that have been presented for the echocardiography indicate that you actually have no change in left ventricular and, and diastolic dimensions in the uh, clip arm, but you do continue to have an increase in the medical treatment arm, so that gives you a rationale that maybe that has been prevented in the intervention uh, arm. And uh, maybe one question I have for you, what I don't like is the meta-analysis Nick has done, because I don't think you can compare the two groups. I much rather appreciate your different interpretation of the yes. various patient groups, but I think you have one opportunity, and that is an individual patient data meta-analysis. Yeah, we're going to you, do that, yes, absolutely. Where you would pool the data yeah. and then look into similar and non-similar patients absolutely. and look whether there is any kind of outcome. So are you planning to do that? Yeah, yeah we are discussing at the moment with a team by Coapt, and we will probably uh, be able to perform a meta-analysis on the true data, and that, this will be also very interesting. If I make one additional comment on, your, on what you said, Stefan, uh, you said that, uh, and this is true, when you follow the patient, you, you can imagine that thanks to the clip, the patient tolerated more the up titration, and this could be the reason why at the end during the follow-up we had a difference in the rate of uh, uh, beta blockers or whatever. But the difference was also present during the selection at baseline, and this interpretation cannot be present for to explain why at the baseline there was some difference. So we have to go deeper in the interpretation to the two analysis, and the best way, you are right, Stephen, and it's to, to go for a better analysis. Unfortunately, we have good relationship between the two teams, and we will be doing that and present, I hope, in the near future, the, 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 the Smith analysis. Dr. Brown, yes. do you want to make a comment? Yeah, thank you. From a surgical point of view, I, I like your presentation very much, uh, uh, apart from the last sentence on your last slide, <laughs> that there is <laughs> no place for surgery anymore in this, yeah, yeah, yeah. In this patient group. First of all, for the obvious reason that both studies uh, particularly particularly excluded patients who were eligible for surgery. So yeah, right. it's a bit strange to, to, to extrapolate that, 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 that those conclusions then to exclude patients from surgery in those cases. But more importantly, I would like to stress that the mitral clip actually uh, reduces or oversimplifies the problem of functional mitral regurgitation because what we have learned from the surgical trials is that those patients not only suffer from the MR with left ventricular volume overload, but also from the initial disease, whether it is coronary artery disease or something else. And in a dedicated heart failure team, we will not only look at the mitral regurg, but also at what has it done, what has it done to the ventricle. Uh, is there right-sided involvement? So do we need to treat the tricuspid valve as well? Yeah. We see a lot of these patients have atrial fibrillation or other arrhythmias. As a surgeon, we can also treat that at the That's same really. time. Yeah. If you look at CRT, we can place an epicardial LV lead just on the right spot where we exactly want it. We're not dependent on how the coronary venous anatomy is. So as a surgeon, we can offer a lot more than just reducing MR to grade 2+. plus. <laughs> What we've also learned, and that, that mesmerizes, me, mesmerizes me the most, is um, that every trial that we've seen in, in, in drug therapy or CRT, the only trials that have made a difference in survival 
compared to, to the other arm, are those that have managed to uh, obtain a true reduction of left ventricular and diastolic or end systolic volume. Mm -hmm. If you look at the COAP trial with these, these fantastic results, at two years, they have only managed to have 1.1 milliliter reduction of left ventricular and diastolic yeah. volume, yeah. while the, those were, who were medical therapy increased by 17.6 milliliters. Yeah. So that, that doesn't fit. Yes, I, I agree. And what is most surprising, and it is a, in correlation to what you say, is uh, the stability of the control with just one clip is the uh, most uh, a dream. And uh, for surgeons who have been involved in uh, this field for so many years, for me, it's uh, most unbelievable to have, uh, when we know that the effort we have done as surgeon to, key, to, to get a good quality of uh, reduction and to see that with just an, with uh, one clip, it's almost 100% after two years, it's uh, so fantastic. Just, just one comment. Uh, in COAPT, as in uh, Mitrae FAR, uh, a tricuspid regurgitation and a wide ventricular dysfunction was an exclusion criteria. But yeah. for the F, but for, general, the F for, for instance, yeah. you are right. And we know from the CASEL trials that the, taking care of the uh, atrial fibrillation in heart failure patient is very important too. So I agree. But we will have to, uh, it was difficult to convince the cardiologists before, but now, uh, well, courage for you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in follow-up to your point, these were surgery-ineligible uh, surgery patients, so... Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's one of the privileges of sitting at, up at the front is, um, during Dr. Braun's comments there was to see the simultaneous nodding from our two um, cardiology um, colleagues to the points he was raising. Let's take a question from the floor. I think that's microphone 10, but I can't see the label, so let's yes, see whether we can hear what uh, you say. So it's Thorsten in Vienna, Germany. Um, Jean Francois, great presentation. Um, it seems that there is a difference between the trial patients that were included, and now the question is, how do we select the patients properly? And um, from for that purpose, uh, I guess we have to relate to echo parameters. And um, at that point, the COAP trial is actually adding another puzzle that uh, I would like to hear your all your opinions on it. And that is the. Um, COAP trial obviously selected the smaller ventricles with uh, an end diastolic volume of about 195, and their stroke volume was about 60, so they had an ejection fraction of 30%. So now the effective regurgitant orifice that they publish is 0.4, and that relates to a regurgitant volume of 60 ml. So if you have a stroke volume of 60 ml and you have a regurgitant volume of, <laughs> volume of 60 ml, I wonder where the forward stroke volume is. <laughs> Yeah, I cannot answer for COAPT, but well, I, in COAPT, the um, uh, echographic uh, acceleration was an integrative approach. So they use either the measure of the surface, but also a part of eyeballing selection. But it is what is recommended in the guidelines. Uh, we cannot rely on only one element. We decided in uh, Mitra FR to fix our selection process on the surface because we, we have no discussion after that. It was a, a clear way to select the patient and we had also to stabilize the patient because we know that this uh, regurgitation can uh, change during the follow-up and if uh, the patient were stable and the regurgitation was still present, we rely on the surface. But it was not the same uh, selection process in COAPT and maybe this is uh, this uh, different approach which explains, but I, I agree with you, this is surprising, yes. I mean, in, in your trial, the numbers add up. You have 45 mils of regurgitant volume, and you have about 90 mils of stroke volume. There, yeah. there is a forward output. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That doesn't seem to exist I, in the coapt. No. I think the point's well made. Thank you. Let's take another question. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Microphone five, please. Yeah, yeah you. Um, Associate Professor Dol Lansry from Australia. Um, there's some limited um, follow-up studies that have looked at the functional impairments of patients after surgery that have shown that there, there's impairments in cognition, in sleep, in functionality. I'm really excited by the, the ART trial and the ROMA trial and I'm just, I'm just uh, wondering whether there's some thoughts um, in, in addition to looking at complications and mortality to looking at um, all domain multiple recovery, cognition, emotionality, depression, physical function. Um, as a physiotherapist, um, and I know when in discussions with surgeons and cardiologists, when you look at patients long term, some of them do have an impact from surgery. Mm -hmm. And now we've got very specific trials looking at 
specific graphs and giving us great information, isn't it an opportunity to also look at the specific graphs and how they have an impact on functionality? Because we know that mammary artery graft does create more chest pain, musculoskeletal chest pain. Okay. Um, that's a known thing. So as a physical therapist, I'm, I'm just wondering, it's an easy thing to do, it's an opportunity, um, whether that's something that people would consider. Uh, I agree with you. Thank you for sharing this comment, and you are right. We should pay attention to all those stuff, but it is not that easy to follow. In the two studies, we evaluate the, uh, the quality of the, of the patient, and uh, we saw that um, uh, in, in, in midwife after six months, in the group who received the clip, there was a significant difference in favor of uh, the patient who, uh, the, who had the clip. Uh, but after one year, this difference disappears. There is probably a placebo effect. The patient who received something uh, felt better. And we have the same in coapt. In coapt, there is also a difference, and it decreases uh, over time. So there is also uh, this to, to, to be taken in charge. Right. Thank you. Let's go to microphone six. John, John Chan from Malaysia. Uh, congratulations on a very well done study. I note that 40% of the patients in both mitral and the coat trial were ischemic MR patients. And uh, 60%. 60% had ischemic disease and the other 40 were dilated cardiomyopathy. Yeah, so 60%. Yeah. So, so we know in these patients that the survival depends on the coronary revascularization not on the correction of the MR. Yeah. Correction of the MR will allow reverse remodeling to occur and will improve on the symptoms, but not on the survival. So I just wonder what happened to the coronaries in the mitral FR trial? Were they all revascularized? Yeah, no, uh, you keep in mind that this is very severe patient and during the selection process in both studies, we have been up to the last possibility to revascularize the patient. And uh, during the selection process, they had either surgery for revascularization or angi angioplasty. And uh, we had to wait at least three months before the randomization. And uh, in the follow-up, no patient had repeat revascularization or, of course, no revascularization by surgery. So, and, uh, you know, the, I, I had two years in the co-op, 50% of the patients were dead. So the problem was no more the revascularization. The problems were really uh, whether or not to treat the mitral valve regurgitation. So, so all the patients in the mitral FR trial who had significant coronary stenosis were revascularized? Is yes, right? absolutely. And in co it was the same. Okay. We'll take just one more question. Uh, microphone five, please. Uh, Mariusz Jasiński, Rokla, uh, Poland. Uh, I mean, I just, I would like to, to call, up, uh, call up here the results from Stitch and Stitches, actually. It is only one, you know, fully randomized yes, trial, yes, a yes, huge yes. trial, you know, just more or less dealing with the similar patients. But it's, it's a little bit like, I mean, one, uh, one uh, the, the, the major results, which was coming out of many papers, it was that the, the, uh, the biggest predictor, more, most universal, predictor of the good clinical outcome was reduction in end systolic volume and uh, in different sort of papers you know which were which uh, came out from from the trial so this is pretty unlikely that we may have a such a clinical benefit without any echocardiographic evidence of reverse remodeling yeah okay thank you right, right. okay oh. Thank you very much, everybody. It's been a marvellous um, uh, session. I'd like to thank the speakers and um, have a good conference. Very good. Interesting.